this meeting actually began about 35 years ago in Sydney, Australia, as an Anglican, or I think we call them Episcopalians over here, the city of Sydney, my home and the suburb there, I was reading Hebrews chapter 9. At that time, I was listening to the Advent Radio Church each Sunday, and I had begun to collect the books of Ellen G. White from second-hand bookshops around Sydney. And as I was reading Hebrews 9 that day, I said, that's strange. This is different to what the Adventists are saying. There is a problem here. The problem wasn't solved by the time I was baptised. And what I'm going to try and give you in the next hour is 35 years of thinking on the problem. And if it seems a bit concentrated, we would remind you that there will be tapes of it in the cassette library, and some of you may want to take it section by section. You see, I am not a Seventh-day Adventist by birth, but by conviction. And the moment that ceases to be so, I will hand in my credentials as an Adventist minister. I rejoiced to find in the spirit of prophecy when I became an Adventist a very open attitude to investigation and biblical research. A false prophet would never have made it so. But I find Ellen White saying that we can never honour God by erroneous opinion, that error is never harmless, and that it never sanctifies, and that every pillar of our faith should be critically examined by us before it is examined by the world's greatest mind. I found in the book, Councils to Writers and Editors, statements like this, page 35, there's no excuse for anyone taking the position that there's no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of scripture are without an error. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for years is not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth and truth can afford to be fair. If the pillars of our faith will not stand investigation, it's time we knew it. That's Ellen White. On page 37 of the same book, Councils to Writers and Editors, we have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think they'll never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. Page 38, God sees that our leading men have need of greater light. 39, the fact that there's no controversy or agitation among us as a people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence that God's people are holding fast to sound doctrine where no new questions are started by investigation of the scriptures. When no difference of opinion arises, there'll be many now who, as in ancient times, will worship they know not what. All good, healthy quotations from one who had nothing to fear. I can remember two years after becoming a Sabbath keeper, walking the streets of a great city, out of work over the Sabbath. It didn't seem to me meritorious or strange. It seemed the only right thing to do. If the seventh day was the Sabbath and that was the truth, it was the only right thing to do and I was too much a coward to resist it. And I preferred to be out of work and walking the streets. And when I became an evangelist, about six years later, it seemed the right thing to do to urge the keeping of the Sabbath upon people, even though it might involve trouble at home, the loss of a job, loss of finance, change of status in the community, and so on. If Christ is the truth, there's nothing to be lost by following truth wherever it leads. However contrary to tradition, many here in this auditorium only became Adventists by throwing over traditions. That must remain our attitude. Christ is the truth. 
and we are to follow him wherever it leads. Now, it was in the 20th century particularly that the bright, some of the brightest lights in the Adventist church began to go out over the issue of the sanctuary. Men like Albion Ballinger, a man of undoubted integrity and spirituality, a man who wrote such books as The Proclamation of Liberty and Powerful Witnessing, a book even recently reprinted. And about 1905, Albion Ballinger was put out of the work because of his views on Hebrews 9. Not many years later, one of the greatest Bible teachers we've ever had in the denomination, W. W. Fletcher, one of our leading administrators in India, then came to the Australasian Division and uh, offered worked in an administrative capacity there, and then became Bible teacher at Avondale College. Everyone that knew that man thought of him as a man of God, another man of undoubted integrity. I met him myself for 30 seconds. He seemed to be the saddest man on earth, and I knew nothing about his background. In the 1950s, the Review and Herald sent to the Australasian Division the new commentary on Hebrews. The SDA Bible Commentary on Hebrews. And the Secretary of the Division, when he read what it said on Hebrews 9 and 10, said, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And the Australasian Division sent the manuscript back with the request that it be changed. And it was. A little after that, I went to America and on one occasion had the privilege of chatting with F.D. Nickel. He said, Brother Ford, our greatest need is a definitive work on the sanctuary. I said to him, we have a lot of problems in Australia over the sanctuary. We've had men leave the church over the sanctuary. And I said, we have men who believe the heavenly sanctuary is an exact parallel with the earthly in just about every detail. He said, let them think it, Brother Ford. We know better than that. And he told me about his experience when he was on the committee that tried W.W. W. Fletcher in this country about the uh, end of the 1920s. Nickel told me, he said, Spicer, you remember the world president, Brother Spicer said to me, it doesn't pay to be too literalistic about the sanctuary. It just doesn't pay. It won't work. A few years after that, Elder Nickel went into Brother Figure. He said, Brother Figure, I am getting so many questions on the sanctuary. Can't we have a committee? Brother Figure says, yes, we'll have a committee. They decided to have a committee where no minutes would be kept. This committee went on for five years and published nothing. The committee contained the brightest lights in Adventist scholarship. Men from the, our own university, men from the Review and Herald, the editors of the commentary, and uh, well-known scholars around the field. No unanimity could be reached. They had planned originally to publish some documents. That plan was never fulfilled and no minutes of the meetings remain after five years of meeting. Several of the people in those meetings took the position that it was impossible to prove the investigative judgment from the Bible. These were very prominent, loyal Seventh-day Adventists. They were not apostates. They were loyal Seventh-day Adventists. And if I gave you their names, they certainly would make quite an impression upon you. Suffice to say that at least three or four of them were prominent editors and writers, editors or writers, it might be safest to say, of the SDA commentary. And that we have thousands of pages of denominational literature written by these men. And several of them declared there is no biblical way of proving the investigative judgment. Today, in the 1970s, in every area of our ranks, from general conference down, there are men that hold the same opinion. 
This is true in all our key institutions. I know many of the Bible teachers personally, and I could itemise off a number that take the same position as, the, as some of the SDA Bible commentary writers and editors as expressed in that committee. For example, one document that was circulated at that time began with this statement. Application of the accepted norms of the grammatico-historical method to Daniel 8, 9-14 does not yield the Adventist interpretation of this passage of Scripture. From time to time I receive letters from ministers mainly who are embarrassed on this topic. Here's one from a man who just left the ministry a little time ago. A good soul winner, a very earnest Christian. I know him very well. Here's what he wrote. It's almost a year ago I made the most difficult decision I've ever had to make. In spite of my love for my church, my work and above all my wife, I felt myself compelled by conscience to withdraw from the ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The main reason why I finally took this rather traumatic, heart-wrenching step was because I had come to disbelieve my church's teaching of a pre-Advent investigative judgment. I write this paper not as a polemic against the Adventist Church, but in the sincere hope that adequate answers might be forthcoming. I continue to love and admire much of what constitutes Adventism, and I still consider myself open to alternative viewpoints. I know my objections are in the main not new, and that answers to these objections have been proffered in the past. However, there's a difference between an answer and a convincing answer. This was part of the paper he enclosed with his letter. Here's a statement from another letter. The Bible and the Bible only can be believed, this is from an Adventist too, who was, after first bringing it into line with the so-called spirit of prophecy in Adventism, I was conscious that most opposition came from the reliance on something outside the Bible. And even when the Bible is quoted in an attempt to oppose my views, I see that the opposition is because of faith in what Sister White has written, rather than as necessity to believe a text from Scripture, that it means what it says. For example, a day for a year is a Bible text often quoted, and they think we deny Scripture if we say, nowhere does the Bible give a day for a year as a prophecy, and yet this is true. See Numbers 14.34. The prophecy is for 40 years, not 40 days. Here's another letter. This one from one of our missionaries. Hebrews seems to say that Jesus entered the very presence of God for us once for all and to the right hand of God, etc., at the ascension. Mrs. White, in early writings of great controversy, puts him outside the veil, in the outer apartment somehow, not inside. And then he goes on to talk about his embarrassment, that he can't discuss it with his fellow missionaries, and he's just wondering what to do. Here's a letter received just this week from another continent. It all started a few years ago when I rediscovered the gospel. At that time, we had a Sabbath school quarterly on the epistle to the Hebrews. I decided then to follow candidly the text and the epistle's author's reasoning. I couldn't find anything about a cleansing of the sanctuary, or an atonement sometime beyond Christ's ministry on earth, I believe Christ went into the most holy place at his ascension. He was accepted in God's presence because he had completed his ministry for, of salvation in favour of mankind. And then he goes on to plead for help in his situation. Here's another, another Adventist. Returning again to Daniel 8.14, as much as I would have liked to salvage some contemporary fulfilment, I find the scriptures silent on 1844. Christ entered Christ's un God's unveiled presence once at the ascension. As much as we commiserate with the pioneers that on October 23, Edson was deceived in the cornfield, we cannot construct a soteriological system on a historical non-occurrence. I think what he's saying then, he may have left out a word or two, he's saying we can't construct a doctrine on the fact that Edson had some sort of a conviction in a cornfield. There are some unthinking people who would like to make a joke out of the fact that it was in a cornfield. Here's another one from a Bible teacher, a prominent Bible teacher in our work. If an investigative judgment is necessary to determine who are prepared for the kingdom of God, how was it that Christ was able to assure the disciples beforehand that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man should sit in the throne of his glory, they also would sit upon twelve thrones? How was Christ able to say to the dying thief, you'll be with me in paradise? 
The truth is, the Lord knoweth them that are his. 2 Timothy 2.19 I know my sheep, declares the good shepherd, and am known of mine. And I could read on and on in that one. There was another, a real scorcher, that uh, came this week. I may have may have mislaid it, and that might be as well. It said what the others said, but with much greater emphasis. Maybe we'll leave it for the present. Well, these are typical letters. Now, because this tape will be used in some rather nefarious ways, because it will be strained and every syllable will be weighed and measured, added thereto or truncated, let me state my convictions, my personal convictions, before I go any further. I believe in a pre-advent judgment with every man's destiny settled before the coming of Christ. I believe the Day of Atonement has a special application to Christ's last work as prefigured by the work in the Second Department. I believe the Seventh-day Adventist movement was raised up in 1844 by God to do a special work and that to it was restored the gift of prophecy in the person of Ellen G. White. There for the record, they are my true convictions. Now give me, let me give you some positive support for the Adventist position, or let me allude to them, because I mainly want to give you the problems. I've been working in this area for many, many years. I did my MA thesis in this area. I went to England about 10 years ago to work in this area and to ransack the Hebrew, the Greek, as well as commentaries in the French and the Dutch and the German and so on, on this very topic. I felt that the conclusions reached from this study substantiated very strongly what I've been teaching my own students for many years regarding the problems of Hebrews 9 and Daniel 8. Much of this, by way of conclusions, I put in my commentary on Daniel, particularly in the preface to Daniel 8 and the preface to Daniel 9. And don't forget the small print, the footnotes. But by way of illustration. Here is a work with a 10-year doctoral thesis. Lloyd Gaston's No Stone on Another. He's no fundamentalist or conservative. But in this volume, I find a typical summary of what some of the best of modern scholars are saying on topics that concern us as Seventh-day Adventists. This man, for example, says, it is impossible to rest content with saying that Antiochus Epiphanes completely fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel 8. Now, those of you that have read my little commentary know that I believe that Antiochus Epiphanes was an apoplasmatic fulfillment, a prior anticipatory, typical fulfillment, just like AD 70 is the preliminary fulfillment of Matthew 24. But I certainly do not believe that Antiochus Epiphanes is a complete fulfillment of the little horn. And here's a modern writer expressing the views of many that says you can't get rid of Daniel 8 and say it only belongs to 2nd century BC by talking about Antiochus. It is an eschatological passage and reaches down to the time of the end. And he goes on to say that Daniel 8.14 is a parallel to the picture of the judgment in Daniel 7. And that the expression then shall the sanctuary be cleansed has to do with an eschatological community of believers being justified. I just mention that as representative of a number of works uh, that could be adduced on a positive vein. I want to get to the problems. Let me just start with three. One of the main problems that faces us is certainly that of the year day principle. Let me read to you from the Review and Herald. I always feel safe when I do that. April 5, 1979. Page 6. It was a question sent to the Review. Why does Jesus say specifically, addressing the disciples who asked him about end events, I tell you this, the present generation will live to see it all. 
the writer's quoting the New English Bible of Matthew 24:34. Then the writer says, but obviously he knew the 2,300-day prophecy needed to be fulfilled before his return. And then the Review and Herald editor, uh, one of the editors, answers. And in the answer occurs these words. If certain conditions had been met, Jesus would have come earlier, seemingly as early as the generation specified in Matthew 24, 34. That is, this editor of the review is saying, yes, Jesus could have come that generation. Did you get the verse? I tell you this, this is Jesus, the present generation will live to see it all. The second coming. The review editor says, yes, it could have happened. If this explanation is accepted and Jesus had come long ago, this, what would have happened to the long-term time prophecies of 1260 days and 2300 days? Some have felt that Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6 established the year-day principle as needing to be applied to all time prophecies. But a careful examination of these passages shows that the principle is applied only to specific cases, that there's no general statement in these passages suggesting that a universal principle is set forth. In fact, Adventists do not apply the principle consistently to all time prophecy. The Holy Spirit gave directions about the year day principle only after time was postponed. At whatever time the fulfillment would have come, the Holy Spirit could have provided the appropriate scale. And then it goes on and on in that vein. That was the Review and Herald, uh, now the Adventist Review, April 5, 1979, Bible Questions Answered, in which it clearly says that the year day principle is not to be taken as a Bible principle for all time prophecies, and that Christ could have come in the first generation. I could talk to you for hours on this one, but I've already written a good deal on it. It's been published, and I've written a good deal more that, Lord willing, will be published, so I'll I'll leave it at that for the present. The second problem is this one. In Daniel 8, 13 and 14, we have a problem of context. In Daniel 8... We read about the nasty little horn treading down the sanctuary. The nasty little horn doing a work of transgression. And then it says, how long to give the sanctuary to be trodden underfoot by this nasty little horn? The answer is given, under 2,300 days. But now note, Adventists talk about the nasty little horn, the Antichrist doing his work on earth, and then suddenly, instead of Antichrist defiling the sanctuary, they start talking about the saints defiling the sanctuary with their sins and thus needing a cleansing. Now, are you following me? The context of Daniel 8.14 has to do with a wicked power defiling the sanctuary, not the sins of the saints. And the question is asked, how long will this wicked power defile the sanctuary? And Adventists in answering it, forget about the sins of the wicked power and start talking about the sins of the saints. And they switch from earth to heaven and they go from Daniel 8 back to Leviticus 16. This is rather thin. It ignores the contextual problem. The third issue, because I have answered that one also in print, but the third issue has to do with the word cleanse. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. On the basis of that word, our pioneers linked this prophecy with Leviticus 16, but the word isn't there. You say, of course it's there. No, it's not there. The KJV is a mistranslation. The word translated cleanse there is not found in Leviticus 16. Different word altogether. That's why almost all modern translations do not use cleanse. And therefore, from all other translations, you are crippled as a way of getting back to Leviticus 16. Now, let me state it again. Adventists have traditionally jumped from Daniel 8.14 to Leviticus 16 on the basis of the word cleanse. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The point is the word cleanse isn't there. It's a mistranslation. It's a translation borrowed from the Septuagint, which used the word because it thought that the context was talking about Antiochus Epiphanes and the cleansing ceremonially by the Maccabees. About 168 B.C. But the Hebrew word isn't cleansed at all, and the Hebrew word here used is nowhere found in Leviticus 16. That's why in my own commentary on Daniel, I refuse to take that route. Now, there's nothing new in bringing these objections to your attention. They have been taught for years in our seminary. Dr. Heaven saw for many, many years 
has explained these problems and given his own answers. Now let me come to the real problem. And I hope you have a Bible. And if so, would you turn with me to Hebrews 9? There's only one place in the New Testament where the Day of Atonement is given a detailed explanation. And that's in Hebrews 9 and 10. This is the only place. You remember the theme of Hebrews is that Christianity is better. In chapter 1 it says Christ is better than the prophets. It goes on to say he's better than the angels. Then it comes on and says he's better than Moses. Then it says he's better than Joshua. Now we're up to chapter 4. Then he's better than Melchizedek. And when you get to chapters 8, 9 and 10 it says he's better than Aaron. The great high priest of Israel who made the day of the year of atonement, the day of atonement every year for Israel. He's better than Aaron. Chapters 8, 9 and 10 are on that subject. Chapter 9 in particular goes into detail on the day of atonement. You'll find in this passage like verses, um, well, let's take verse 7 into the second only. The high priest goes and he but once a year not without taking blood which he offers for himself and for the errors of the people. Look at verse 12. speaks that he entered once for all into the holy place, or as most versions give it, the most holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. And then in verse 24, Christ has entered, not into a most holy place made with hands, a copy of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest entered the holy place yearly. And that word holy place means most holy in this context, with blood not his own. Please note that Hebrews 9 is talking about an entering of the second apartment once a year with the blood of bulls and goats. Let's take our most recent translation, the New International. I'll read to you just one or two verses from there. Please note it very well indeed, because later on some of you will say, but... The Spirit of Prophecy says, and I agree with what the Spirit of Prophecy says, but I want to make sure you understand all that the Spirit of Prophecy says, and even before you know that, all the Bible says. That's the place to start. Now here's Hebrews 9, and please note what it says in verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. In case some folks try, as Questions on Doctrine tried and some other books have tried, to make an issue out of the Greek, the word that is here translated most holy place is literally holies. The Septuagint uses it repeatedly in Leviticus 16 for the most holy place. The word itself can mean the sanctuary as a whole or it can mean the first apartment. Or it can mean the second apartment. You can prove nothing from the Greek because it has these possibilities. But from the context, it is obvious. It's speaking about a place that the high priest alone went once every year with the blood of bulls and goats. Are you with me? Listen to it again. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, that's bull calves that was offered on the day of atonement, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 25, Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Back to verses 7 and 8. Only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle, first apartment, was still standing. Please note, talking about goats and calves, they were the offerings for the Day of Atonement. It's talking about the once a year entrance. That was the most holy place. He's talking about the high priest. His distinctive work was only that. He supervised things in the first apartment, but he had no distinctive work there. 
The distinctive work of the high priest was the second apartment. Furthermore, it's talking about the cleansing with blood of the heavenly sanctuary. Verse 23, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, for the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ didn't enter a man-made sanctuary, but he entered heaven itself. The cleansing of the sanctuary, the day of atonement, is what is being discussed. Let me underline it again, because you must get this point. The book of Hebrews distinctly teaches that Christ went directly into the most holy place at his ascension. There is no way out, round or through it. I have ransacked every nook and corner and twisted every syllable. There is no way out or round or through it. The book of Hebrews chapter 9 teaches that Christ went directly into the most holy place at his ascension. I will repeat for you verses 7 and 12. Only the high priest entered the inner room, that only once a year and never without blood which he offered for himself. Then in verse 12, he didn't enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Every commentary in the world has seen it, my friends, except one or two by Seventh-day Adventists. Now in chapter 6 and verse 14, we have a very important expression used, within the veil, which casts light on this topic. Not verse 14, but verse uh, 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary, behind the curtain, or within the veil where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. Here, Hebrews 19 and 20 clearly says, Jesus went within the veil. This expression is only used in the Old Testament for going into the second apartment. There is one possible exception, which is really no exception. Numbers 18.7. That I could speak on at greater length. The book of Hebrews, when it quotes the Old Testament, always quotes the Greek version, the Septuagint. And the Septuagint only uses this Greek phrase for the second vial. That was the only one cultically significant. The only one. And the expression within the vial always means into the second apartment. There are about a dozen statements in the New Testament where it says Christ sat, entered and went and sat down on the right hand of God or sat down on the throne of God. I overcame and am sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 3. A dozen times it says he entered straight into the presence of God. Adventists have sometimes tried to get around this by inventing a movable throne. Now whether that means that the ark is left behind in the mercy seat in there and just some other aspect of the throne comes out, I'm not sure. But the spirit of prophecy is very clear that the most holy place, and made ever the holy, was the centre of the divine work of atonement. And there's no biblical basis whatever for moving throne. None whatever. And if some wish here at this point to say, but Sister White saw in vision the Father arise and enter a flaming chariot and go from the holy into the most holy... I would remind you that you should read closely what the Seventh-day Adventist commentary says on the nature of symbolic vision in its notes on Ezekiel 1, a special note at the end of Ezekiel 1, where it points out that the prophets didn't see the actual, but saw a representation that was meant to teach them something. In early writings, you read in the supplementary notes, the supplement Ellen White put in, how she was criticised for describing certain people bowing before the throne who were wicked people. And the critic said, fancy having those people in heaven. And Ellen White said, I never meant to say they are in heaven. I am but recording it as it was presented to me. Didn't John see a great red dragon in heaven? Ellen White had a sense of humour. Apocalyptic visions. Apocalyptic visions are not to be taken as graphical, literal representations of the unseen, my friends. They are sketches within the experience and culture of the contemporary prophet to teach them something. 
Very important to understand that. When you read in Jeremiah chapter 13 about the prophet Jeremiah being told to take a girdle and take it to the Euphrates, and then after so many days go and get it back, you might be led to think that was next door. It was a thousand miles away. And United didn't exist then. He didn't go to the Euphrates, nor did he go and get it back. It was all done in vision. When you read in Ezekiel 4 about the prophet lying on his side 360 days, he never did, except in vision. And some of the things that Hosea did that may seem to shock you find the same key of explanation. So within the veil, sitting at the right hand of God on the throne of God can only mean the most holy place. We've said many things in connection with the sanctuary that won't stand. We've spoken about how every day the blood went into the holy place, was sprinkled there, and so it became defiled. Two errors there. Number one, the blood usually didn't go into the holy place at all. Very, very rare the blood went into the holy place. Usually it was poured outside at the altar. Secondly, we speak about blood defiling. You will not find anywhere in scripture that the blood of a sacrifice ever defiled. It's always presented as cleansing. Always. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Well, there's nothing adequate in print on these topics. I've had a few swipes at it in print, but knew if I was very frank, it would never be published. So I said as much as I could, beginning back in the 50s, and have had some things published touching on the problem. What should we say about it? Well, the first thing that I must say is an answer to what you will say. But, Ellen White... Now let me point out to you that Ellen White clearly teaches that Christ went into the most holy place at his ascension. In one place she says, still bearing humanity, he ascended to heaven, triumphant and victorious. He has sprinkled the blood of the atonement on the mercy seat. That's at his ascension. Let me give you the reference. Signs of the Times, April 19, 1905. Listen to it again. Still bearing humanity, he ascended to heaven triumphant and victorious. He has taken the blood of the atonement into the holiest of all. Notice he's quoting Hebrews 9 and 10, and she's applying the holiest of all to the most holy place, the place where the mercy seat is. Because the second half of the sentence says, sprinkled it upon the mercy seat. So here, Ellen White says that Christ at his ascension went into the most holy place and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. I would point out to you that after Ballinger had written his book on this topic, E. Andros, a very devout Adventist scholar, for the first time went into printer saying, yes, within the veil does mean the most holy place, and Christ did go there, immediately ascended. That book is uh, a more excellent ministry by E. Andros. But of course, Andros had to get out of it some way, so he said he went in and he came out again, went back into the first. Listen to this one from Acts the Apostles, page 33. And please note that Ellen White here, as in many other places, is a rebel. The greatest rebel we've ever had amongst us was Ellen White. Praise God. No other Adventist writer would have dared to write some of the things she wrote. I'm so glad she wrote them. They convinced me that she was led of the Spirit of God in the way that you and I have not been led. Listen to this one from Acts of the Apostles. It's a wonder the editors didn't wipe it out. As in the typical service, the high priest laid aside his pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of an ordinary priest. So Christ laid aside his royal robes and garbed himself with humanity and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. As the high priest, after performing his service in the Holy of Holies, came forth to the waiting congregation in his pontifical robes, so Christ will come the second time. Now please note, here she applies the Day of Atonement from the Incarnation to the Second Advent. Did you get it? As in the typical service, the high priest laid aside his pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress. When was that? Day of Atonement. That's the only day. As, as the high priest did that in the Day of Atonement, so Christ laid aside his royal robes and garbed himself with humanity. There's the Incarnation and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. Here she goes beyond Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith said he wasn't a priest. Crozier says he wasn't a priest. 
Crozier and Smith both said it wasn't an atonement. Ellen White departs from, the, from them in all three. She says it was the atonement at the cross. He was a priest. And it was the day of atonement from the incarnation here, she says. Now, please don't go out and say, Des Ford says, the day of atonement began the incarnation. Please go out and say, Ellen White says. I didn't write Acts of the Apostles. I wish I could have. From the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1109, the mercy seat is open to all who accept Christ as the propitiation for sin. The veil is rent. The petition wall is broken down. Christ came to demolish every wall of petition, to throw open every compartment of the temple. This is Christ's Object Lessons now, 386. This is why, my friends, in the book of Revelation, where you have some of the furniture symbolically pictured from the first apartment and the second apartment, you never find a veil. Never find a veil. The New Testament knows nothing about a veil in the heavenly temple. Ellen White says there's a new and living way into the holiest of all before which there hangs no veil. That's Ellen White. But the strongest statement I leave to last. It's never been noticed. We can read and read and read and not know what we're reading. But in a book written years after Great Controversy, the greatest book Ellen White ever wrote, a book where she is more careful to exegete rather than just homiletically apply passages, Desire of Ages, the greatest book in the world next to Scripture, all this talk about Ellen White's plagiarism, sure she used other books in preparing this book. She used Hannah and she used Dr. Harris and she used Edersheim and she used Thara and she used Daniel Marsh and she used a number of other books. Sure she did. But my friends, those books are open for anyone. I don't see them coming up with a Desire of Ages. The issue isn't did Ellen White use sources. It's what use did she make of them? What did she come up with? The sources are available for everyone. And people don't come up with a, uh, with a thimble full of quality. The sources are there. So here's the greatest book she ever wrote. And please notice what she says in the end of the chapter on Calvary. Speaking about the rending of the veil, the earth trembles and quakes, the Lord himself draws near with a rending noise, the inner veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand, throwing open to the gaze of the multitude a place once filled with the presence of God. In this place the Shekinah had dwelt. Here God had manifested his glory above the mercy seat. No one but the high priest ever lifted the veil separating this apartment from the rest of the temple. He entered in once a year to make an atonement. Then a little lower down she says, now type has met anti-type. 